and welcome back to Wine Reform. Today I am joined by my wonderful mother, Diana. She is going to join me on a wine tasting and we're gonna basically go through the process and uh, show you guys how it's done. So today we are tasting a biodynamic tasting set. And you're probably wondering what the heck is biodynamic. Don't worry, I wondered the same thing until I did a little bit of research. So if you're really into following the rhythms of the earth and you were uh, kind of an astrology buff, you're probably going to appreciate biodynamic wine. Basically, this is a holistic way of seeing agriculture in general. The concept itself is not new. It's been around for ages. If you've ever heard of the Farmer's Almanac, it follows the same sort of principles. So my mom actually mentioned that to me and I went, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I was trying to understand what you were saying. Yeah, basically. <laughs> like, Wait, are, are you talking about Farmer's Almanac? She goes, yeah, that's it. Exactly. kind of like that. Exactly. Basically, all you do is you pay attention to the lunar calendar when you water, when you prune, when you harvest, and when you leave it alone, it all corresponds with the movements of celestial bodies. Whether or not the science is actually there to back it up, not really sure, but the fun thing about biodynamic viticulture is that when you make wine from those grapes, um, you actually are able to supposedly taste more of the terroir, which is to say you can taste more of where the wine is actually grown, so less about what the winemaker was interested in showing you and more about what they wanted to show you that their soil could do. Oh. Biodynamics, uh, it falls into a cycle, and there are flower days, leaf days, root days, and fruit days. On the flower days, that's when you don't touch the vineyard, leave it alone, let it do its thing. In case you're ever looking at a calendar, the flower days corresponds with the astrological sign for Libra. The leaf days are the days that you water your vines. These are the days that um, are most auspicious to give it that H2O, and it corresponds with the astrological sign for cancer. Uh, so maybe if you're into astrology, you can see a trend. The root days, the days that you prune the plants, give them a little bit of love and care, those correspond with the sign for a Taurus. And the fruit days, the days in which you harvest your grapes, uh, correspond with the sign for Aries. So really it's split up into four, and though it starts with those signs, so that's to say here's where this cycle begins, it actually corresponds with a few months, and then you'll have, okay, here's another cycle, and then it corresponds a few months so hmm. fun stuff so do you have they noticed that there's a, a, a contrasting difference in the way that the grapes um, turn into wine I, it's been proven that they they feel like by doing it this way they're actually getting a better product in there in the way that they're looking for some winemakers will say that they notice but a lot of sommeliers don't necessarily know if there's a difference it really comes down to what you prefer okay um, well, I'd like to try to find out yeah so it'll be fun to see <laughs> there are two classifications for for biodynamic wines so okay. if you want to guarantee that your wine has been certified biodynamic you can look for Demeter International which is for uh, wineries and vineyards around the world, or you can get the Biodivin, or Biodivin, I don't know how to pronounce it. I read it, I don't know how to pronounce it, but basically only 100 European wineries get that one. I see that this bottle has that Demeter certified. Exactly, on so it. we do Labels have- on there, okay. Yeah, we do have one wine that has definitely been certified biodynamic. Uh, something to note, biodynamic is not necessarily the same as organic, it goes a step further. Oh. In the sense that their composting methods they, uh, for a true biodynamic wine, they'll actually take a lot of food and plant waste and material and they'll stuff it into old cow horns. Cow horn? And they'll bury it. We're not exactly sure where the idea came from, but it's really synonymous with the idea of a cornucopia. Interesting, because it reminds me of those little miracle grows things that you stick in the ground. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. You do that, but with... Cow's horns. Cow's horns. So it's not necessarily vegan or vegetarian. If you're looking for a wine like that, you're not gonna want a biodynamic. So now that we've established that, let's talk about what we're tasting. So we have a wine tasting set. We have three wines, all from France. And uh, two of them are from the Languedoc region, the uh, southern part of France. And then one of our wines is actually from the northern Rhone. So far north. Uh, when we're tasting wine, it's really important that we go in order from the lightest wine to the darkest wine. Oh, and why is that? Basically, what you're, uh, what you want to do is you don't want one 
to overwhelm the other. So is it because of the tannins in the red wines that's likely to overwhelm the lighter wine? Exactly. Okay. Well, I'm learning a few things with you hanging around. Them. <laughs> so I'm learning some stuff here. Why don't we open the wines and then we will talk about each one as we go. Wines are open, so now we're gonna get started. Like I said, when you're doing a tasting, even if you have separate glasses, which we don't because I don't have an enough. <laughs> Works for me, but you mentioned that there's a trick that you do when you've got one glass. Exactly. I remember you said that one time. So we'll, we'll get to talk about that. Awesome. Since we're doing a tasting, we are gonna start with our lightest wine. And today, that is our M. Chapotier, I hope that's how you pronounce it, <laughs> Viognier. What we're gonna do is we're going to write down the winemaker. That's in Braille. Oh yeah, the fun thing about this one, yeah, it does have Braille on the label, which makes it really neat. That is cool. We'll write down the winemaker. We're gonna write down the region. So the region is um, also known as like the Appalachian, d'Origine, Protégé. It's in French. It means the region where the grapes were from. Gotcha. And then we're going to write down the vintage. And the vintage um, for this one is 2017. Um, the vintage is the year the grapes were picked. What a good year. Exactly. So that's why some sommeliers will actually say, for this wine, the best year was because maybe the grapes just did better that year. I wonder how they find that stuff out. You taste it. You just taste it. You keep tasting all the wines from that year, and then you go, yep, this was a good year. Basically. <laughs> okay. And then we'll write down the alcohol by volume. So for this first one. M. Chapoutier. I think, yeah. Chap Chapoutier. 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 That was my high school French. The alcohol by volume is 12%. So that's pretty average for an old world wine. <laughs> so we have these white papers in front of us. What you do is you'll hold it so that you're getting light in there and observe the color. Oh, that's beautiful. I mean, I'm only seeing any color whatsoever really along the edges. So, I mean, it's very faint yellow. I'm getting like a, like a really, really pale, almost canary yellow. Yeah, that's a good description. Now, something else to note is sometimes when you're looking at a wine, not only are you looking at it for the color, you're trying to see if there's anything floating in it. So I don't really see any sediment other than the piece of fuzz that fell into my glass. So for appearance, we're just gonna write down the things that we saw. It looks really pretty. It has a brightness to it. But if you thin it out too much, then you, don't, you miss out. You don't really see the color. Something else to note for anyone watching, when you're doing a wine tasting, there is no right answer. Because you're not tasting, unless you are a wine writer, you're not tasting for an audience. You're tasting so that you can remember what you saw and what you smelled and what you enjoyed. Which made me feel so much better and more confident when I was starting to talk about it in front of other people. Exactly. Oh, well, I do this. And when you look confident and you sound confident, it's like, oh, she must know what she's talking about. Which is all that. I love it. Um, other than color, do I put down, like, clarity? Mm -hmm. so, so what would you say on the clarity? Personally, because I'm not seeing anything floating in it. Yeah, I mean, it really wasn't. Yeah. And clarity doesn't necessarily have to do with um, how much you can see through the wine. Oh. It has a lot more to do with... Um, how much of that wine is pure liquid? <laughs> oh! If that makes more sense. No! <laughs> what do you mean by pure liquid? So, a lot of times um, you can have a really heavy tannic wine. Okay. That's really dark and light has a hard time getting through it. But if you swirl it around your glass mm -hmm. and you can't see through the wine, but you can tell that there's nothing in it beyond wine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then... I see what you're saying. No sediment and stuff in it. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Next thing we're gonna do, since we did swirl it and aerate it, is we're gonna give it a good sniff. Ooh, fruity? Yeah. <laughs> what, what kind of fruit are you smelling? Peachy? I, I can get the peach. I'm getting like a hint, a hint of a sort of yeastish, yeasty mushroom flavor, but that comes after all the freshness of this really? one. I would get, I definitely got the peach. Yeah, because that's the only, I don't have as good of a sniffer, so I only smell the peach. I don't, I mean, personally, I'm also getting a bit of lemon rind, almost like a, like a limoncello, if you've ever had it. Yeah! Limoncello, yeah. yeah. I do smell that. Okay, I didn't before. Suggestive. I kind of like this because it smells a lot fresher and fruitier than the tend to be. It looks also really refreshing because I noticed that when I have sweeter wines that they kind of stick to the glass a lot more. Do I get to try it now? Yes. Okay. So we take one sip to sort of prep our palate and then the second sip is when we evaluate. Okay, what if my first sip is the rest of the glass? Your first sip is the rest of the glass and good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do what you do. 
I can't do that. I'll choke on my wine. <laughs> I feel like I like make a little pull. I go, kind of go like, uh, and then I go, uh, but I don't go. Uh, I kind of go. Uh, I'll choke on it. <laughs> I have tried doing that. I haven't showed you. I've tried because I can't do it, but I have tried. So the reason I do that is because a lot of times um, your taste buds are very closely associated with your nose. So if you have more air, then you're gonna get more aromas. Ooh, I like it. This is kind of dry though, isn't it? I would say but this is a, I, yeah, I'd say it's a dry. Cause it doesn't taste it. It tastes too refreshing to be dry. Would it last longer the more drinks you get? More sips? <laughs> <laughs> if if I take a sip, okay, I have very little left. Mm -hmm. So if I take a sip and I after my fifth sip, would it start to just kind of linger? Linger longer because it's been in my mouth five times as opposed to my first sip. <laughs> No, I don't think okay, so. Okay, so that's not what you mean by lingering, though. Yeah, like if you if you take a sip and you put it down, how long do you more. taste it? So, first of all, the mouthfeel on this one for me is really cool. Wait, I, you know what? I wonder if it tastes differently before swirling it too much. Oh, yeah. It does taste differently. I like it after it aerates a little bit. It's so light. I was kind of getting um, very faint lemon lemon water because it wasn't I was gonna say lemonade but I said but it's not sweet but lemon water is more accurate because it's not sweet and then I got a bit of um again nutritional yeast I do taste the lemon water I was gonna say lemonade but that didn't feel right so I'm glad you said lemon water how did it feel in your mouth like it's not ling it's not sitting around for me to continue to taste it I feel like I feel like it's something that won't overpower anything else it's a short finish that's it Okay, something I have to say now because it's really cool. So a lot of times viognier is something people pair with seafood and it's because of the mouthfeel and it tastes kind of, it feels almost buttery or oily as it coats your mouth. Okay, I can see that, except for the fact that I don't eat fish. Oh, I don't which either. Which is why you, I think you enjoyed saying that. <laughs> oh, I don't either. But I definitely, I personally did get the oily coating of my mouth. Like some wines will sort of sap your mouth of moisture. This one felt like it was coating it in olive oil. Okay, I wouldn't quite say that, but if it's in contrast to the pulling, like, what did you say? It's pulling the moisture from the mouth? Yeah. It's not doing that for sure. Yeah. So yeah, I can see why you say that it does um i did notice that that i wasn't going oh i want more oh it's making me thirsty yeah. oh i want more oh it's making me thirsty it wasn't like that so that's cool that's cool so i didn't get the oily i can't quite comprehend that so i will put that down did not make my mouth feel dry so something to know is when you're tasting a wine you don't i mean the wine really it means nothing to you later unless you write down like how you felt about it okay so that's notes at the end would be what was the finish like and you said like short finish yes and so then, instead of, no, 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 okay. So and you could sorry. write short finish in palette, but sometimes people just put it in their final notes. And then you could also write, did you enjoy it or not? I did. You think on a scale of like one to 10? We'll see, and that's, so how do people decide on a scale of one to 10 if they have different likes for different groups of wines? It's a personal preference. So honestly. for white wines, I would say this would be um, like on an eight or a nine. But if you compare it to, you know, I like sweet things, if you compare it to that, then I I wouldn't put it up that high so I guess if I would put it just with white wines itself I would definitely say about an eight or nine. Maybe what would you eat this with? I mean this would go really well I think with the brie because the brie is a very soft flavor. I would also eat it with like some sort of potato dish. So now we're gonna taste wine number two. When you're tasting from the same glass you don't actually rinse it out with water between tastings because that waters down the wine. So you'll pour a little bit and then you swirl it around your glass everywhere your first wine touched. So uh, close enough? Yeah so once you've thoroughly coated your glass you can either discard of the excess or you can drink it. I'm drinking. We will go through the tasting guide once again. Uh, we're gonna write down what we're drinking. So this one, it is a Cote de Rosé by Gerard Bertrand. It is a blend of Grenache, Syrah, and Cinso. So a lot of times when a winemaker will actually list their blend, it will be in order from most prominent grape to least prominent. And it is from the Languedoc region, which is in the southern part of France near the Pyrenees Mountains. So a lot of sun there, a lot of warmth and Mediterranean heat, and it is a 2019 vintage. This one, it gets higher in alcohol. It is a uh, 14.2%. So we can kind of hold it up to the light, see if we can see any floaters in there. None. So light, it, to me, it looks like a nail polish shade that the queen would wear. It is really pretty. Ballerina blush pink. Oh, we have the color aside. We get to get a whiff. Ooh, it smells yummy. It really is very similar to this one, I think. I'm getting a really pale uh, 
floral fragrance. It isn't as fruity. It's like unripe strawberry. And herbal, I mean, I guess it's to me smells a little bit more like rosemary. And it's almost like, kind of smells almost like faintly like an apothecary to me. I think now we get to taste it. Okay, good. I honestly think it's quite delicious. And I think the flavor I was getting more than anything once once getting past the alcohol mm -hmm. and past the acidity, I got just florals, herbals, florals, herbals. Huh. Like it, it tasted like, it tasted a little bit like a watered down tincture. <laughs> I can't, I'm having trouble getting past the alcohol content. I am struggling on this one. And that's okay. If you can't pick out a lot of flavor, then you can't pick just out a lot of flavor. Just put down acid. I mean, it's acidic, but it's light. Light bodied has more to do with the mouth feel than it does with how much it makes you salivate. Gotcha. Okay. So light bodied, acidic. I honestly, I think it's really tasty and quite refreshing. It wouldn't be my first choice, but I think I would enjoy it with blue cheese, a little stronger. That'd be pretty good. Yeah. I hate blue cheese, but I can see it. Short finish? Um, if I can get the drop out of here, I'll tell you. Short finish. I'm honestly picturing pairing this with like brunch foods. You could have this with a, something sweet, but it'd have to be a very light kind of sweet. Like a cheese souffle? Ooh, that'd be good. Ah, cheese souffle. I do like sushi. I would pair this with sushi. sushi. <laughs> we are going to gear up for our final wine and our biodynamic tasting. Ready. You see, I'm looking at it. I'm ready. So this one is actually the only one that officially has uh, the biodynamic certification. So this one is actually another wine from Gerard Bertrand. Uh, he's a winemaker who focuses on biodynamic wines and he has a lot of properties in which wine is made. So this last wine is going to be the uh, Gerard Bertrand Chateau d'Hospitalet uh, Grand Vin. So this one is a blend and this one is from, let's ask something to pronounce it for us because I need oh, to know. Oh yeah, that's right. You can do that, can't you? <laughs> yeah, you can. Clape. Okay, so this is La Clape. La Clape. It is from La Clape. Something I do know, um, obviously not how to pronounce it, but uh, La Clape is a part of the Languedoc region. Okay, so <laughs> this wine is a blend of Syrah. Uh, Grenache and Mouvedre. 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 Where is it? Is it on there? Oh, so yeah, what? it's right here. Mouvedre. <laughs> Mouvedre. Although my spelling could use help. It, it looks like Mourvedre. That's what it looks like. And then we'll put. Mouvedre. Mouvedre. Man, this is gonna be really entertaining for someone who actually knows how to pronounce this. <laughs> or really irritating. Or really irritating. Take your pick. <laughs> um, wowie, zowie, the alcohol content is so high. <gasps> no, wait, where is it? I read it wrong. 15.5%. The vintage is 2017. Okay. Ready? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold it. You're this gonna hold it this yeah. time. No spell. Yes, yeah, no. And it was the red one, so that's good. All right. Okay. So now we get to go through the process once more with our final line. The appearance. What color do you see? Garnet. There. Yeah. I see it. I mean, especially when I swirl it, I see garnet. So. This looks like a wine's wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. So. Yeah. Red Nose. Smell. Yeah. Sniff. Wait. Oh, it sniff. So good. Cherry. Yeah! <laughs> it almost but smells like... Smoky cherry. Smoky cherry, and I'm getting a bit of like a, sh oh, like a shoe polishy kind of smell. Now I am happy though because this is a really, this is a, a red wine. The flavors are, or aromas are so heady that they're not being overpowered by the alcohol. Yeah, okay, I was wondering about that. Mm -hmm. Because I was thinking it's higher alcohol and I could not do that with the last wine. Okay, ready? Ready. Okay. First sip to Cleanse, second sip to evaluate. Pruny. <laughs> Astringency. Arugula. It's a bitter green. Oddly enough, I do too. It has some acidity. Acidic, but light. Faintly peppery. Faintly peppery. You wanna go, we can go to the, All right. we can go there. Um, I was gonna say, really thick steak. Really heavy seasoning, like peppery seasoning. Yeah, I think it would taste really good with that. This would definitely keep up with it. And Brussels sprouts. Yeah, especially the way I make them. I think it has a surprisingly short finish for a red wine, though. A little bit more than the other two. Yeah. But yeah. Short. Short finish. Yes. Lasagna. 
That's it. That's, That's it. it. Well, that was tasty. Yep. Okay, if I had to pick a favorite, though. Yeah, which one did you pick? This one. The Viognier. Mm-hmm. This wine tasting set I actually found on wine.com. Not sponsored. Uh, the set as a whole is uh, was $80, so that rough roughs out to about $20 per bottle. Um, however, without that, uh, every bottle would have been closer to $30. So if you can find a bundle or deals or whatever, if you're gonna splurge on your wine, I highly recommend going for a bundle or a deal. You know, you definitely got a lot of flavors out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's almost wasted on someone like me who doesn't get as many flavors from it, but I still enjoy it, you know, but, um, but you definitely, for someone who can really taste the wine um, and really get all those flavors out of it, you know, you get what you pay for. <laughs> and you don't need an expensive set to do a wine tasting. In fact, you could do a wine tasting with varieties of box wine, and I think it would be just as fun. Because really, the whole point of a tasting is to just get a bearing for what you like. And you get to talk. Exactly. To your friends. Exactly. To your kids. I, I actually think that that's the best part of, of wine tasting, is just when you get over the fact that you know it's not a right or wrong thing. This is exciting for me because, you know, we get to sit down and chat and talk about, you know, the wine and even threw in a few memories there, you know? So, yeah, I think that's pretty nice about that. And wine is, yeah. If it's something you can taste or smell, it's so tied to memory. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Without my mom, I honestly would not have the interest I do in wine. I think that growing up with you and Uncle Jeff, your brother, you both going to <laughs> wineries and me sitting there and being bored, but <laughs> uh, later I think that the influence definitely seeped into my life and it's because of you guys that I'm so into it. I enjoyed it. I filled up my paper. That was a lot of fun. So thank you, Mom, for joining me. Thank you for having me. This was fun. And thank you for joining us here today on Wine Reform as we went through a biodynamic wine tasting. If you like what you're seeing, give it a thumbs up. That really helps. Let me know um, if you have any questions about the wines that we were tasting. Leave them in the comments. If you know how to pronounce anything, leave it in the comments. And if you really like what you're seeing, be sure to subscribe. And there's a bell icon. If you hit the bell icon, then I think, I think it's on that side. And after she does her wine tastings, we get to enjoy it with dinners the following few days, depending on how long they last. Thank you again for joining us today. And I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>